Welcome, Wim. Uh, thank you for being here in our series on 3D leadership. Um, and we will be talking today about vision and the importance of vision for leadership. But before embarking on that topic, um, I would like to ask you to say something about who is Wim. Thank you for having me. Um, who is Wim? Uh, I guess uh, I started as a lawyer. Mm. Uh, I still am a lawyer, actually. Um, but um, um, I had a, you know, a probably um, more ambitions than just being a lawyer. Um, I love the, uh, the building uh, side of it, the people side of it. And so um, I've been in the same organization for many, many years. Um, but obviously my organization has changed a lot. Um, we've um, added on people, uh, growing people. But actually, I guess that what I really enjoyed is developing the people side of it mm -hmm. and servicing um, clients who often are friends. So um, that's the professional whim. Okay. Um, so, and um, when we talk about the topic of vision, it's actually really nice. I just have to say this because I have to get it off my chest. It's really nice to be interviewing you because at this moment in my life, I also come, as you know, from the legal profession and we actually go back 35 years. Yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> and so also to do this interview in English is a little shift. So I, I just want Absolutely. to like <laughs> connect like that with you about it. Um, so, um, you were actually my coach. Yes. Because when we were studying, um, you were already assistant professor in international law. I was still a student, a last year law student. Mm -hmm. And uh, you coached the team for the Jessup International Law Mood Court Competition. Correct. And already there, and that's why I want to embark on that, because already there, I think that what you just say about the interaction with people and the connection was already very, very prominent there because um, I think I told you before, because you had a defining moment in my career at that time, really encouraging mm. me for believing in myself. Yeah. So again, publicly, thank you. <laughs> um, so vision, um, what, in your opinion, what does vision mean to you? I think it's a, a, a knowing which way you're going, what, what your... Um role uh, uh, or meaning for other people is um, and as an organization because you often um, in the role I have you kind of um, your vision and the vision of the organization go hand in hand very often and so it really is I've, I've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about it. it really is about what is our role as an organization in society what is our role towards our people what mm -hmm. is our role towards our clients and from there, there's a lot of uh, things that, that go on. But, uh, but what you actually try to do is be a, a good citizen as an organization and, and as a, um, a well-operating, uh, pretty high-level organization. I think we have a duty uh, towards society. And, um, and that is a big part of what we do. Um, we obviously want to develop uh, our people, bring the best potential out of them. Um, and that means um, there's a lot of detail in that, but actually it's uh, it's really about having honest conversations about their future, about mm -hmm. their potential, what they can achieve, uh, etc. And the third element, of course, is ultimately we're a business, we're here for, for the clients. Um, and so really understanding uh, what they need, what they want. And, you know, I, I've always, uh, I, I often define our role not as a service provider, but as a partner for our clients. So those are the three big pillars that define define our vision. I when I look at the um, website also of Ellen and Overy and um, and as part of the vision I believe is the being the most innovative company and you already had that award also for Europe by the Financial Times I think six times in a row seven, or seven, seven times in a row. Forgot, yes. I lost count. Uh, <laughs> and um, and that is also largely due to your own vision. No, I mean well, you, you maybe you maybe right? no, I know you you are probably more humble about it than than. Well, there's a lot of people involved in that. Of course, but, but, but again, that is about empowering people, um, um, creating a, an environment where there's a 
forgiveness for failure because innovation goes hand in hand with failure. I mean, typically professional services firms are all about success, mm -hmm. but actually you can only innovate by taking risk and taking risk means sometimes, you know, you, you go the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I guess my role is about creating that environment, encouraging people uh, to come up with new ideas, give them air cover to try mm -hmm. them, and if they fail, don't blame them. Mm -hmm. um, so that that I think is is what my role is. And then, <clears throat> of course, the ideas um, come often from younger people. So it's really giving them the space, the opportunity to to develop them, give them the money to 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 develop them. Um, and then make sure, you know, just uh, apply some common sense on what the ideas are. Uh, so my role is, is kind of confined to that. It's creating the environment for people to, uh, to innovate. Uh, but yes, we, we've, we've been successful in it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's all about, uh, well, making it interesting for the younger people, but again, developing uh, their talents. Um, and ultimately, uh, providing more efficient services to the clients and better services to the client. And that's where innovation obviously comes together. You went from, um, I believe it was after 2008 that you became managing partner yes. and then now senior partner at Ellen Overy. So after the financial crisis, and then you, you broadened also the scope of the legal profession with some specific initiatives. Could you tell maybe a bit more? Well, about that? it starts always with you know what do the clients need, right? Um, and they need more than reactive legal advice. They they want us to partner with them, and so you know what are their needs? And actually, they're evolving all the time. So it really is about listening to the clients, involving with them. Um, and of course, two thousand and eight was a big financial crisis, which resulted in huge uh, challenges for many clients in terms of compliance getting the financing for the business they, uh, they're involving. F frankly, it was about financing the global economy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, where do the clients need us? And so there's a big shift in the financial industry, for example. Um, you know, the, before that crisis, the six largest banks in the world were European banks. Um, the bulk of the economy was financed by banks. Now it's um, it's moved to private money. It's moved. To, it's Americanized a lot. Mm -hmm. um, capital markets play a bigger role. Not yet in Europe, but in other in other markets. Well, not not to a big way in Europe. I mean, continental Europe. Um, um, and all of that kind of is a shift that the clients experience and that we uh, render services to. Um, we've also, um, I think, one of the the challenges for clients is that they, you know, our clients are global players and mm -hmm. law by definition is domestic um, and so they don't um, clients don't come to us for a specific you know italian or german law issue but uh, come from this is a project we want to do uh, it's cross-border cross legal specializations and we integrate that service to them and so we've opened a number of um, additional offices i mean asia is the is obviously the continent of the future, mm -hmm. um, half of the world's population, half of global GDP by 2040. So we've invested heavily in Asia. And the other challenge for law firms is that, uh, you know, you are a Belgian lawyer, I'm a Belgian lawyer. Belgian law is relevant in Belgium, uh, mm -hmm. but, but not outside. And so the two exceptions to that domestic nature of the legal industry are English and American law. Mm -hmm. And so what clients really need is is the combination of those global systems with deep knowledge of domestic law. Mm -hmm. And so on the back of that, we've, um, for example, shifted our finance practice f from, you know, uh, towards private equity, uh, private okay. money mm -hmm. providers. Um, and if you look at, I mean, obviously we still service, I mean, the main clients of the organization are still the large global banks there's no there's no change but there's actually a big bulk in the global economy that's now being financed by private money so we've we've invested quite heavily in that we've obviously were originally a european firm so we've invested a lot in our us law uh, capabilities and we've grown asia because because of the longer term um, future and potential growth um, and then of course specifically in asia whilst 
originally it was Western money going into Asia. What you now see is it's Northern Asian money going into Southern Very Asia li- largely. Mm-hmm. And so we've really adapted the organization to follow all those uh, flows. And then, of course, there's many more trends like there's GDPR, uh, there's ESG now. Um, so there's there's plenty, plenty other developments. I guess the main challenge for the legal industries were a secondary industry. We follow the clients. We follow what's happening in society. So we're not, we're not at the forefront in a way of what the society or business uh, wants or moves towards, but we follow uh, the clients and we follow society. So we really need to be very aware of what's happening and really adapting the organization to what, uh, what's happening. And uh, yes, you follow and yet being this innovative firm and having the awards of, for that, um, it's it's more than following. It's also le- particularly leading in your industry. Within the industry, yeah. By combining also and opening up and seeing the cross-fertilization among different mm. areas of, of... Maybe you could tell a bit more also about Fuse and some other, other things that you've been... Uh, yes, so the innovation... Area. The innovation piece really is about um, every industry goes through change because of technology. Mm -hmm. And the legal profession is no exception. I think those who think it's an exception, well, they're wrong. Um, and, And so you can either see it as a threat or see it as an opportunity. We've obviously seen it as an opportunity. I've gone, I've gone all the way. Um, and so we've launched a number of initiatives. It's, you could almost describe it like a, it's a seed capital approach. You try mm-hmm. a project um, and it works fine. You build a business out of it. You try something, it doesn't work. Then you kind of pull it and, and try something else. And so the um, there's a legal services. The, the, the law firm model is actually pretty old. Um, mm-hmm. It works on leverage, hourly rates, classically. Yes. And the bulk of the industry still works like that. Um But with technology, with alternative delivery models, as we call it, you can actually change the business model and make it more efficient, more effective for the clients and actually more interesting for our people because the commoditized, I mean, technology will kick in in the commoditized level, Mm -hmm. not at the sophisticated level. So all the commodity and every law firm does commoditized work. So if you can replace that with either an alternative business model or technology, actually it makes the work for the lawyers more interesting Mm -hmm. because they can... Because it's the added value for the lawyers. Exactly, for them and for the clients. Um, and so there's there's automated drafting. There's a uh, you know big repapering uh, technology. Artificial intelligence is actually um, growing in in the industry. Um, and then there's a, there's a huge compliance piece as well, where technology again can can uh, can help. And so when you mentioned Fuse, actually that's kind of our laboratory for um, coming up with ideas. And so what we've done with Fuse is actually we invite every six months. We invite a number of tech players in the legal tech, uh, deal tech, compliance tech, and actually fintech. Mm-hmm. And so we, we organize a tender. Mm-hmm. Um, we usually have between 100 and 150 applicants for six spots. And we then host them for six months for free in our buildings. And we work together with the clients and our lawyers to develop new technologies, innovation in the legal uh, sector. Uh, and that could be drafting, compliance technology. Um, there's there's plenty plenty of examples. We've done an automatic uh, bond issue, automated bond issues. Uh, there's there's a, there's a number of uh, kind of practical uh, uh, consequences or, or, or delivery models that we've been able to develop thanks to those companies with the clients and ourselves, actually with with um, uh, financial authorities as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so every six months. We take a fresh look at who's there, who needs us, who doesn't need us, what we need, uh, what they need, what the clients need. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has given us um, uh, there's two huge benefits. One is high level of engagement of our lawyers and our clients, because obviously they're interested mm-hmm. uh, in, to, new, in, in yeah. new ways of delivering yeah. legal services. And they've got big challenges, uh, mm-hmm. both the clients and we do. Um, so, And technology can help there. And that is one um, opportunity. And the other one is, I would call, engagement. And because 
if you have an innovative organization, I mean, you can you can start. But what we started is innovate by delegation. The few uh, people who are interested, they take initiatives, but it's maybe two percent of your people. And what you really need is everybody to engage with it. And that fuse model has basically allowed us to expand the involvement of people. There's no threshold. Mm-hmm. You can just walk in there, ask questions, um, think, you know, do the, the blue sky thinking with the clients, with yourself, and you don't need to know anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that, um, I think is almost the biggest benefit is the, the level of engagement mm-hmm. by the clients, by our own people with, New ways of delivering legal services is is uh, has you know exploded enormously since we since we launched uh, Fuse. We we call ourselves the most advanced law firm of the world, and for me, advanced is about challenging the way you do things. Co- even if you're very successful, constantly, constantly think about is there a better way I can mm-hmm. deliver this, or is there a more efficient way I can deliver this. So that's the that's the thinking behind it. It also sounds like Fuse is, um, I'm always interested in how a vision that you have for a company or for, for your organization, how it becomes ingrained in the organization from a behavioral point of view, how people start acting and interacting according to the vision, because, because otherwise it's like loose words and you don't, if you, you can say like you're an innovative company and, and few Everybody seems else. like when you said like, exactly, mm. where it is actually a place where you can in, walk in and out and where people experience it and experience also that it's okay to, to do something and to fail at it. And that that's part of the process. You've achieved it when other people say you're innovative, not when you say it yourself. Yeah. That is yeah. that is the ultimate goal. Um, so you can every every company says it's innovative, right? right. Uh, but when other people start saying it, uh, there's a there's the, there's a technological challenge. Maybe we should go to Allen and Overy. That's when you've um, managed to do it. So it really is about allowing for failure, as I said, and how to move from that first to second generation innovator. How do you? engage the entire organization rather than just the people who have an interest and that that is the that is the the challenge and how do you build mechanisms in the organization to achieve that and that's that's the challenge mm-hmm. um, and the challenge is even bigger when you're having success because if you're successful why would you change anything mm-hmm. and and so it, it's it's almost easier when you when you're in trouble to, to, to be creative and innovative than, than when you're successful. Mm-hmm. So it makes it even harder for successful organizations, I think. If we talk about leadership and the importance of vision for, as, as a leader, um, for you personally, you know, what you just said, like this, when you talk about vision and innovation, this constant challenge, is that something that you do for yourself personally as well? Well, I think it comes down to the people side. Well, you have, a vi- I mean, obviously I, I know what my competitors are doing. I speak a lot to the clients. Uh, I read a lot about what's happening in society. What are the new trends? I mean, you can, we can talk about diversity, for example, which yeah. is kind of up there now in terms of priorities, right? Um, so, so you, you, you constantly, I think, think about what does it mean for us? How can we, um, do the right thing? How, how, how can we, um, you know, spot and deliver on the opportunities uh, that are there. And then it's about, I think it really is about taking people along. Um, it really, and, and uh, give ownership. Mm-hmm. D- don't, this, this, I mean, you'll never see me talk or, or hardly see me talk about Fuse publicly. It's other people who do it yeah. because they ultimately do it and they see it as their project yes. and that is important. Yes. And so you create the environment for, and you to trust people to to have them own it and frankly, when it's successful, give the credit to them, which is which obviously they deserve as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really, um, and sometimes you, you kind of fuse I remember when we launched it, uh, people asked, what's the business model behind it? Well, it doesn't make money, right, as, as a business, but it, it's, a, it's a cultural shift in your organization. It's not a business as such. Mm-hmm. It really is about 
the change you you want to achieve but you have to overcome some of these hurdles then you stick out your neck right i mean that is yes. what, that's what you that's what you do when you when you really believe in it. obviously i've compared it to other industries i mean we're not we're not the first ones to to launch this type of idea there's many other companies that have done it but not in the legal industry um uh, the same goes i mean we've got a business called peerpoint which basically is the is the business model that the IT industry works on again in the legal industry was hardly hardly used as a, as a business model it's got huge advantages very different but it works I've got over 400 people working in it uh, uh, right now so something's right right and, and there is client demand so we launched a consulting uh, business because on the compliance side for example um, you know clients you know, appreciate our legal advice, but actually they then want to know how to implement. And and they were not satisfied with the services they got. And they came back to us and said, why don't you do the implementation piece as well? And so the consulting business is how we, how we, how we started that. But again, I don't deserve the credit to build. I mean, I've heard it from the clients and said, okay, let's try. Let's recruit a few people that know what they're doing. Let's spend some money on it and then see whether it works and then they run with it and obviously they've been successful so so then it's in then you know it's it's kind of a the early days you kind of have to encourage give air cover but once it gets going you 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 you, you basically have a strategic review every six months about what they're doing what they're focusing and often it changes actually but uh, they know better than you do right so you said you talked in the beginning about vision as something like you need to know where you're going. Mm. But what I what I notice in how you talk is, and also from from knowing a bit more about Ellen Hoover, it's it's the ability also to really see across different disciplines mm. and to integrate that because that's what you said. Like it exists, but it existed somewhere else, and then you apply it. To, so it's the ability also to to see pretty wide. And, well, I guess that's the, that's the problem of uh, the training of lawyers, right? We, we and actually most yeah. university degrees are train you, yes. they train you to be analytical, mm -hmm. and obviously to be a leader in any business. I think, of course, you have to understand your okay. industry, yeah. but actually you have to be able to make a much to take a much broader view, a much you know wider and and actually. Um, Kind of make a judgment. Uh, it's not. It's it's an art. It's not a science, right? Whilst most university degrees are science, they're not art. And and for me, leadership is really an art. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's science based. Mm -hmm. It's you you do a lot of reading, a lot yeah. of analysis. Yeah. But ultimately, it's, it's about the judgment calls. Because if you don't take any risks, you're not going to be a leader, right? So, yes. you, you, um, and that's, I think, where as lawyers, we're not wired. To take risks, we're advised. We're, we're, we're wired yes, to exactly. advise on risk, but not to take it. Yeah. And that's that's I think where um, actually it starts at university. Um, I think it's the training, um, and and that's probably what's missing at, at, in the training of lawyers. It's mm -hmm. the it's the broader uh, vision. Um, you know, politics, economies, uh, uh, business. Um, is something that we're not necessarily prepared for. Yes, yes. Mm. And, I, and apart from what I've seen, what has been done at Ellen and Over is precisely that broadening. Broader picture, yeah. yeah. Could you say something more about how short-term and long-term... Constant challenge, right? I mean, yeah, because one... I remember something that you said to me in another conversation about... Um, suppliers and like what what to do like on a short term making the budget versus long term and staying true to to who you are as a company. It's it's um, I guess every business has that challenge, right? Yes. Uh, short term profits or investing in the longer term platform. We, I mean, our industry is extremely competitive at the top end in terms of what you can pay. I mean, the the measure. Uh, is still is profit per partner and and um you know you could you could run the business just pushing the profit per partner um and some of our competitors do um 
And, and so we have the challenge to invest for the longer term. I mean, investing in Asia or whatever, or Fuse or uh, whatever, does cost you money short term. And so your profit per equity partner this year will go down. Um, and so how do you find that balance between investing for the longer term? I mean, I, I always say to my younger partners, I'm not going to be here as long as you are. So you tell me, you know, how long term a vision we take. Because my, my tenancy is short compared to, to yours. Um, and so it really is a constant conversation about what is it that we invest in? What are the priorities? Because there's more ideas than there is money. Um, so, you know, what do we focus on? What is really important? Some of it is defensive. Some of it is offensive. But you always have to, stay in touch with the market in terms of profit per partner because if you lose that touch you don't have to, I, I don't think you have to pay at the top end but you have to stay in touch with you know what our partners can get in other in other places mm -hmm. and if you lose that touch then you then i think you're you're in trouble so there's a there's no uh, often uh, and again that's the art piece there's often um challenges of put to you as is it black or white is it short term or long term it's always in the middle somewhere yes. and it's all about the balance between the two and there's, there's and you never i don't think you ever achieve the right balance you constantly have to adapt it's like work life balance it's, i mean it's like many of these issues are put to you as a black or white choice and, it's and it never is no it never is and so that's the same. If you lose touch with the top paying partners, you focus on your bottom line because otherwise you lose your competitive edge. But, but you have to balance that against, you know, my, the next generations of partner who's going to be there. They will be there for another 20 or 25 years. Obviously, I won't. Uh, so you, you kind of have to make sure that you invest in their future um, so that they have a, a better platform to go forward than the one I found when I, when I started. It, as, as you were talking, it, um, I reflected on the fact that the mere concept of profit for part, per partner in itself may also become different or... or mm. I think I mean, it's the wrong measure. Um, but and that's, also that's that what, may also need some innovation. Or, yes, but the, that's what the market does. I mean, there's certain things you can't change. And that's what the market, that's what the legal press does, that's what partners do when they compare to other partners. Is it the right measure? As a business, it's not. I think it, as a business, I think you have your revenues and market share, and what's your profit margin as a whole? Um, and any other business would look at, at it that way. In the legal industry, it's the profit per partner. And, and I, I don't think one firm can change that, one law firm leader. I, I don't think it's the right measure to measure success of, mm -hmm. a, of a law firm. But that's the reality. That's what the market judges you by. And so that's what, that's, what, that's what you have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, you know, I would, I, I mean, I think it's interesting because also there, there it seems like on the, innovative side and the measurements of the innovation that is, feels like a bit of a disconnect. Oh, well, it is. And that's why there's not that many innovators in the legal industry. Right. Because the, a lot of the firms are focusing on that, which is also why you see a number of firms retracting to a few financial centers, not investing. I mean, Asia, you have to think, there's much more volatility in emerging markets. So if you take the profit per equity partner per year, you should stay out of Asia. Because, right. because you've got good years and bad years, not just Asia, emerging markets more generally. Yes. You know, we're, we're, we have offices in Africa, we've got uh, Brazil. I mean, it, it's like that. You've got very good years and you've got years where, where, it's, where it's harder because the risk is just higher. Um, but, I, but that's the long term um, uh, logic. Asia, you can't, I don't think you can afford, if you want to be a global top law firm i don't think i mean now you could probably still afford to stay out of asia in 10 15 years time i don't think you can and so that's the longer term investment you have to make now uh, volatility also means you've got golden years as well right which we've had in asia as well so so it, uh, but you have to take a longer term view and not just do it year by year would you say that for you personally in terms of the balance between 
short term and long term in this longer vision, your heart would be more on the longer term? I do definitely. For me personally, yes. Because it comes out like very strongly. Yes, yeah. uh, but you can't, I mean, again, you, you have to balance right. it, right? I mean, th there's no point saying we're now going to invest half of our profits in the no. long term. No. Because the next thing that happens is you lose 20, 30, 50 of your partners. Yeah. Because, you know, they've got a different... Sure. There's also, um, there's a generational difference, right? I mean, partners at 35 or 40 years old have different logic than 55 years old. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, you know, you, again, there's a balancing act to be found. And, and so that, that is a constant debate. Me personally, as an organization, as a platform, I think we, you know, yes, if it was only my business, uh, which it isn't, then of course I would invest for the longer term more than uh, for the short term profits, yes. If you were to summarize for um, a leader, any any leader of an organization, small or longer, what would you tell them or give as advice on the topic of vision? Well, to have vision is one thing, to deliver on it is another thing. And that's probably the bigger challenge. And deliver on it really is about um, inspiring other people and, and, and do it in a team, not, I mean, you, you never, there's no leadership without followership, as there, and there's no followership without leadership. So they go hand in hand. And so I think delivering on a vision really is about uh, a team and, and, and have a shared vision, a joint vision, with clear ownership of each of the components elements. Um, having a vision is relatively easy compared to delivering it, I think. So aligning the people along the vision and making Absolutely. sure it really happens. Valuable. And building it together. It's not just yeah. your vision. It's building the vision together, listening a lot, uh, building consensus. Because when you've got a consensual vision, actually delivery becomes easier than when you tell I'm the boss and this yeah. is the vision. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. Thank you very much, Wim, for this insightful uh, <laughs> interview around Pleasure. vision. Thank you. Pleasure. Some years ago, when I gave a training around change processes and I talked about the topic and the importance of vision, I asked all the people in the room to go stand on one leg with their eyes closed. And you saw many people wobbling. And then I asked them to go stand on one leg with their eyes wide open. And amazingly enough, almost everybody stood very still. Now, the point of that was it was the lead in to the topic of vision, because vision is really about opening your eyes, really seeing uh, what is happening around you and not only what's happening right in front of you, but I mean, really all around you and not just with your eyes, but with your all your senses and your whole being sensing what is happening. As was clear in the interview with Wim as well, um, he in with the firm had the ability also to to do this to also see what the cross fertilization is among different businesses what the trends are in society and to really see at a much deeper and broader level what vision is all about and how you can turn that into innovation for the company so some people in the organization um change when they see the light, as we say, that's the vision. That's where you want to go to is the pool. Other people change as well when they feel the heat, when it, they have to change. So vision is an important part of that because it also, in terms of an organization, pulls people. It's what, what uh, energizes people and how you can tag along the rest of your organization as a leader by having a strong clear vision, a short-term plan, and a broader intent and vision. So very practically, practice your vision. And you can do this with a very simple exercise, is like enlarging your view, really seeing things more broadly. You can practice it by not focusing on things, but having your eyes wide open, but also see what happens around you literally also see what happens around you by seeing things more broadly. 
Also, when you have a vision to make sure that people buy into it. So it has to be clear and has to be genuine and real. And from the very top to the bottom of the organization, it has to become actionable has to become clear what people actually have to do. When you, for example, say we open communication or we are a very innovative company, if you don't do anything to promote innovation, if you um, are not okay with failure and, and punish people for doing things wrong, you're not going to be an innovative company. So practice what you say around the vision. So I wish you lots of success with doing this in a broader and more practical way, because vision is in the end to really, truly open your eyes. Thank you for listening to the Cues of Click. We hope that we have inspired you and that you have learned things that you can use in your daily life. Please spread the word, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media.